Thank you, Rod. Just, um, can you hear okay outside with a microphone or without? What do you prefer? You're good with both. Oh, I like that. Our next guest, we're very excited to have visiting our community of Chilliwack, is Mark Angelo, a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of BC. Among his many accomplishments, he is perhaps best known as the internationally celebrated river conservationist, and he's a teacher and a paddler. <laughs> He is founder and chair of both BC Rivers Day and World Rivers Day. And this event is now embraced by millions of people in more than 60 countries. And even as I speak, I don't know if I even got those statistics right because it's growing. Mark has been an advocate of the Fraser River for many decades. And he did paddle the full length from source to mouth. And since we're not worried about years, back in the early 70s. <laughs> So let's Chilliwack, let, and, and people from outside of Chilliwack, give Mark Angel a very warm welcome, our, our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you, appreciate it. And it's wonderful to be here, and I'm certainly honored to share the stage with our other speakers, Clarence and Glenn and Rod. They all bring wonderful and very important perspectives to this very important issue. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. It is great to see you here. And I also want to thank the organizers of this particular forum. They put a lot of effort into making this event happen. I think it's a very important event. And for all of us in this room who care about the Fraser River, and I sense that encompasses all of us, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. Now, as you well know by now, having heard from so many speakers, we are here to talk about the hazardous waste treatment plant that uh, has certainly generated a lot of interest in this community, but as Rod so appropriately said, it's, it's generating a lot of interest in much of the rest of the province as well. This is a facility that's going to handle large amounts of toxic waste, and Rod just outlined some of that, but uh, I think duplication in terms of some of these presentations today is warranted, and once again, it just emphasizes the messaging Large amounts of toxic waste, things like gases and cylinders, flammable liquids, toxic substances, infectious wastes, PCBs, mercury, you go on and on and on. And the volumes are high too. Rod talked about the volume of transformer oil, the number of light bulbs per month. It's, it's staggering when you think about it. And all of this waste is going to come from a wide area. Now this plant is proposed for Connor Road. I'm sure it's a site that many of you know. It's a site that's very close to the Burke Brink Wildlife Management Area, an area that's dear to my heart. Actually, I was there at the announcement and the opening of that with some of you just a couple of years ago or a few years ago. The property itself is about nine hectares in size, and Council is proposing to rezone part of it to a specialized industrial zoning so that it could accommodate the plant. And I think Glenn gave a really good overview of what's been unfolding in that regard. At this point, though, I think it's really important to talk about the character of the site for those of you that have not been on it. This is a wet site, and it's only 100 to 200 meters from the river. As Rod said, it is basically on the banks of the world's greatest salmon river. There's already an apparatus in place there to move water across to the wildlife management area. There's a creek nearby. And if you look at the geography and the sediments of the site, if you were to analyze those, there is certainly the potential to leach chemicals directly into the river through spillage and leaks. Already, that's an issue that is very common. As we speak, it is already very common in other such treatment plants. There's no reason to think that this plant would be any different. The site is also susceptible to at least some degree of flooding as opposed to being a non-flood risk altogether. And there's a really important distinction there. I had someone from the city tell me the other day that, well, if the river levels ever get too high upriver, we could just move all the toxic materials off site for a short period of time. But an approach like that is fraught with risk. 
So when you add it all up, the bottom line is this site is too close to the river. And that closeness provides no grace. I've had my own experience with a similar plant that I'll tell you about shortly, but that's a really important message. The closeness of this plant to the river provides no grace period whatsoever. So bottom line, it is not an appropriate site. It's also really important, and once again, this is duplication of message, but I think it's such an important point. It's also really important to emphasize once again that all the groups here are very supportive of the importance of treating toxic waste, of handling toxic waste, of recycling it where possible. We're very supportive of that. A few days ago, I just got back from Bangladesh, where I was filming a segment for a, a, a global river documentary that will be out this fall, entitled River Blue. And we filmed some amazing sequences of huge volumes of toxic chemicals flowing directly into the river. That was occurring at a huge environmental cost and a huge public health cost. And I've seen lots of other examples of that around the world. So once again, I strongly believe in the importance of the kind of treatment work and the kind of recycling work that Avitas does, Avitas being a proponent. But once again, our concerns center on location. Simply because this type of plant carries an element of environmental risk. Because of the materials they process, a plant like this does carry an element of environmental risk. And sometimes it's a pretty significant element. I was in Dayton, Ohio in the early 1980s. Just for a short period of time, I was asked by a group to visit a local hazardous waste treatment plant. They were having major problems with pollutants, toxic pollutants, leaching into the aquifer. They were very close to a nearby aquifer. It turned out to be a huge problem, and cleaning up that mess took a fortune and it took many years. Now on the positive side of the coin, that episode, that particular case, led to some positive changes and how treatment plants are constructed, how they do business. And many of the companies around today certainly are much better than the company that was involved on the Irwin Street facility in Dayton, Ohio, starting in 1978. I was there about 81 or 82. So the industry has certainly made some improvements. But I also think we have to learn from the past. And if you look at what came out of that Dayton catastrophe, a lot of new principles a lot of new standards of practice. And one of those key principles was that plants such as this should not be placed in environmentally sensitive areas. That makes a lot of sense. So once again, looking back at Dayton, looking back at what we learned, looking back at some of the problems we have with our own plants, even today, the extent to which leaching still occurs. Plants like this should not be close to a river like the Fraser. They should be placed away from the river and out of the floodplain. And if you look elsewhere across North America, that's the usual protocol today for facilities like this. They're not to be placed on the banks of a river like the Fraser. For a moment, I, I want to talk about optics in that I did a CBC story yesterday on this particular issue, and I got a call from a friend of mine in the media shortly after that. And he asked me if I would speak to him about optics, the optics of this whole proposal. Now my preference, normally, just like it is for the others up here, my, my preference is usually to focus on things like principles, things like facts. I'm a real believer in fact-based advocacy as an example. But I also appreciate that optics are important to some. So he asked me and I answered. I told him, imagine an announcement a year down the line that a toxic materials treatment plant is to be built. And then, that was followed up with the wording that, quote, the only location we could find is on the banks of the Great Fraser River. <laughs> Think of the optics of that. The only location we could find for such a treatment plant was on the banks of the Great Fraser River. I think the optics of that would be terrible. I think the reaction would be swift and very negative. 
I also think it would reflect poorly on our beloved province. And to Adidas, a company I do admire, it's also important for them to know the lead part of any kind of newspaper story or news story like that would focus on the controversial and poor location of such a plant. That would be the lead part of the story. I also believe the story would run locally, it would run, inter it would run nationally, and it would run internationally, simply because the Fraser is one of those icons amongst rivers. So I do think it's important, especially from a political perspective, to think about what the optics of this might be if things don't change. Now related to that, I want to provide some context of the Connor Road site relative to the Fraser River as a whole, and especially relevant to the, or related to the heart of the Fraser from Hope to Mission, part of the river that's really, really special to me and many others in this room. I've had a special attachment to the Fraser for a long, long time. And it was over 40 years ago that uh, I first paddled the entire length of the river, 1,375 kilometers. We started in Mount Robson, worked our way down, and I, and I have to say it was a life-altering experience for me in many ways. And I know some of you travel the river close to us quite regularly, and I think for anybody who spends time on the Fraser River, you can't help but look at it as anything but the heart and soul of our province. It is an amazing waterway in every sense of the word. So anyway, we had a wonderful trip, and as we got closer to the end of our trip, we traveled through the Fraser Canyon, which was spectacular. And back then, in those early days of paddling, you know, paddling through the Fraser Canyon, not a whole lot of people did it. It was a, uh, it was a great adventure. We then worked our way to Yale, we then got to Hope, and at Hope, and a lot of you, you've been downtown Hope and you see that beautiful lookout over the river, when the river hits Hope, it does that big swing to the right. And from downtown Hope, the main road, you, look, you can look down river, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous view. Well, at that point, we had been on the river a long, long time, and I must admit, I was beginning to think about my bed. I was beginning to think about taking a nice warm shower. You know, we were getting close to home. But I have to say, in the final few days, final several days of our trip, going from Hope to Chilliwack to Mission, I was taken aback by the beauty of the river along that stretch. Taken aback because I didn't expect it. That was my first intimate encounter with the Hope to Mission stretch of the Fraser. The back channels, the islands, the Fraser Foreshore, the broadening valley. Now many Vancouverites, I have to say, as close as they live to this part of the Fraser, many Vancouverites have never seen it. In that when they head out to the Fraser Valley and elsewhere in our province, they drive over the Portman Bridge, and then you don't see the river again until you're just about all the way to Hope. There's a few places where you get a quick little look at it, but basically you don't see it until you get all the way to Hope. So as a result, there's a lot of people in Vancouver who just don't appreciate how beautiful and how special that part of the river is. So I've had a love for this part of the Fraser ever since. I might quickly say even the birth of Rivers Day can be traced back to the Fraser you know, I look back at 1980, you know, when we decided, hey, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an event in our province that celebrated the great natural and cultural and recreational values of our rivers. So we pulled a wonderful event together, small scale by today's standards, but we pulled a wonderful event together. I was very fortunate to work with my good friends at the Outdoor Recreation Council of British Columbia. And, and that was the beginning of BC Rivers Day. And it was so much fun that night we met in the Lit Pub, you know, right where the Thompson hits the Fraser. And we said, God, this was great. Let's do this again. So we organized a few more events the next year, some very close to your community, then a few more the year after that. And then BC Rivers Day took on a life of its own. The province proclaimed it. Many communities proclaimed it. And within not too long a period, we got to a point where tens of thousands, on, on a good weather day, sometimes 75,000 people were coming out on BC Rivers Day to celebrate in events in every municipality, in every corner of the province. And then nine years ago, we approached the United Nations about undertaking a World Rivers Day celebration based on the BC Rivers Day model. 
It would occur on the same day. Uh, it would also fit in nicely with their UN Water for Life decade that they launched back in 2005. So to make a long story short, we got their blessing. And now there are thousands of Rivers Day events that take place around the world and millions and millions of people participate. But to me, I will always be proud of the fact that the roots of that global celebration, which is one of the biggest global environmental celebrations in the world, that the roots of that celebration can be traced back to BC Rivers Day, back to our province, and back to the Fraser watershed. So now let's talk a little bit about the heart of the Fraser, the hope to mission stretch. And the area we're talking about is right in the middle of that. The Hope to Mission stretch of the Fraser is one of the most productive stretches of river anywhere on Earth. It sustains close to 30 species of fish. It sustains our largest single spawning run of salmon. And that's the 26 million pinks that were spawning in the main stem just last fall. 26 million pinks. That's phenomenal by any measure. It has our largest sturgeon population. It's a migration corridor for millions and millions of salmon, both adults and smolts. So you're talking about a section of river that has immense natural values, and it's right in your own backyard. You live in one of the great places in our province, one of the great places in our country. This same stretch of river has immense cultural values as well. Many of the most important cultural sites in our country can be found along the Lower Fraser. So Clarence Penye's comments, I think, are so relevant and so important. But given the proximity of the heart of the Fraser to Greater Vancouver, this same area faces some real development pressures, as you can appreciate. Things like urbanization, agricultural expansion, industrial development, now ideally, there is a need for a collaborative plan for the heart of the Fraser that will focus on protecting key natural and cultural values. But until that day comes, we end up fighting fires against inappropriate development proposals. And this is one of those fires. And for all of the reasons that you've heard, I think it's a very significant one, and one that I hope is extinguished. Simply because, the main reasons for that, simply because this proposal is not consistent with the carefully thought out plan aimed at protecting the key values of the river. And it's not consistent, and it's not consistent with the need for a precautionary approach. You talk about science, a fundamental tenet of good science is taking a precautionary approach. And I think that's essential for an area like the heart of the Fraser especially. Because if there was ever a spill or a leak or a leaching issue, the river would be inevitably impacted because of its close proximity. Most importantly, there are safer alternatives. I will never believe that the only site for a plant like this has to be on the banks of the Fraser River. I will never buy into that. And I think many of you, I'd like to think, feel the same way. So my hope is that the city of Chilliwack will help the proponent find another, more suitable site. I think that's a very reasonable request. But if not, we know there are safer sites in other nearby municipalities where a company like Adidas would be welcome. I also want to take a moment to laud the local groups and individuals in this room that have gotten so involved in this issue. The Stolo Tribal Council, various sports fishing groups, recreation groups like the Outdoor Recreation Council, river related groups, salmon groups, environmental groups, many, many individuals. The list goes on and on and on. So this is an issue that's resonating with a lot of people in your community. 